Welcome to Navigating Change, everybody. My name is Pete Wright, and I'm sitting here with the good Mr. Howard Teibel. Howard, how are you? I'm doing great, Pete, and I'm just enjoying doing this with you. It's getting more fun the more we do this. I totally agree, and I particularly think this week is going to be another great uh, topic. We're going to be talking about something that is of particular expertise uh, in your bailiwick. We're talking about process mapping. Uh, can, can you give us a background on what a process map is first before we get into the meat of it? Yeah, that's probably worthwhile doing. So basically think of it this way. Uh, a process map is a way to graphically represent how work gets done. So let's let's put this in the real world. Imagine that you've got five people going on a trip in five separate cars. A person pulls out a map, opens it up, and everyone's looking at the map together and they're saying, all right, we want to end up here. And next thing you know, there's a conversation about as a group, because obviously we all, wanna, we all wanna get there at the same time. So we figure out what's the best way to get there. And we put the map away, and then we drive there. Or actually, maybe we all have the same map, and we take that with us on our individual trips. It's the same idea in business, uh, in any kind of administrative environment where there is roles, responsibilities, technology, uh, workflow, and so on, a process map is a graphical way of representing the work of the institution. It could be, this is our procurement process. This is our travel expense reimbursement process. But if you take those apart, you'll discover that there are many dependencies in it that involve different people uh, doing different things. Okay, so uh, I, I, my experience with process map in a big organization, with process mapping in a big organization, is uh, it, it it tends to be pretty discreet. That that when you ask a manager, when I start on a new team and I ask my director, what, how do I know? What's the rule book of, for my job? I may get a process map or two. But it usually is not very comprehensive. It's usually about a discrete action. It sounds like what you're talking about is broader than that. In terms of, of a best practice, uh, you're talking about something bigger than just a, a discrete process or a discrete kind of specific function, but more of how to get the job done. Am I right? Yeah, and, and actually how to get the job done in the context of what is the ultimate objective. You know, if you think of it this way, most uh, people understand a very limited amount associated with what we'll call the work. So let's imagine Bob, you're Bob. Okay. Well, you're Pete, but I we'll can, call you Bob I right now. I can be now. Bob. Oh, thank you. So you're Bob, and Gail is responsible for giving you something, and you're responsible to give Sam something, and that's part of a process. Very likely, you know what to expect of Gail, and you know what to give Sam. But if I asked you, what about what Mike is giving Gail or what Sam is giving Jane? Do you know what they're doing? You probably do not know what the chain is outside of what's directly preceding you and what's directly after you. And that is the fundamental challenge with an organization getting work done in an efficient way is – People have a very limited silo view of what it is that the work is. And why, you, at, go ahead. Why, sh why should I care? If I'm Bob and I know what Gail is giving me and I know what I need to give to Mike, why should I care about Janet and Jane and Spencer? Well, you know, that's interesting. I mean, there's a number of answers to that. We'll start with the first one that has to do with what I think most senior managers, management would like to see happen, but they don't necessarily, uh, they won't necessarily spend too much effort on that, is that everybody feels like they're contributing to an overall purpose. But I can tell you, if that is your objective, that your people understand how their work is contributing to some larger work, if you don't have that bigger picture, you actually are just a cog in the wheel. And people basically lose motivation. They don't see why they're important. So that's one piece. But let's extend it even further to this idea of what it means to provide customer service. If all you're focused on is getting the stuff from Gail that comes to your desk off your desk and onto Sam's desk, 
then you're not paying attention to, and neither is Sam and neither is Gail, to the ultimate objective of serving whatever customer you have, whether the customer is in the higher ed faculty, whether the customer is a uh, someone who's buying your product. And that is where I think the breakdown happens. Third reason, and probably most important when it has to do with efficiency, is that until you understand, and Gail and Mike and Sam and Jane, understand the language of the big picture, you cannot take it apart in a way to think about efficiencies. Then all it is is somebody else's, else's good idea. The real power in this is when you can get the group that's doing the work to visually react to the work that they're doing and see what it is, they can then start taking it apart and to say, well, this is how we can do it better. Okay. All right. So uh, that that actually helps me frame this pretty well. How did people do this? Uh, how did organizations do this before? I mean, I, I don't... I, like I said, I remember a few little function process maps, but but I don't remember big, you know, full function, full job process maps. How did you communicate this kind of information effectively, you know, sort of pre-process map, pre-visio? Right. So, so one clarification I just want to make sure everybody understands is that what we're really talking about is demystifying that that the process maps that we create or we help others create. When you would look at these. There's obviously a flow, but when you get taken through it once, you understand work in a way that you never understood it before. So this is really about simplification versus complexity. Okay. It's about taking something complex and making it simple. So I just okay. want to clarify that. I would say prior to process maps, and this still goes on, and this is why this is still of importance, is that I think there are two, two ways that organizations translate or transmit information uh, for people to inherit a process. Think about yourself going into a new role. How do you learn that task or become part of that chain if you're a new employee? There's really two ways it happens outside of these process maps. One is word of mouth. So you walk into a role and either the person that's leaving that you're replacing teaches you what the role is and what you're supposed to be doing, how to get Gail, basically how to get Gail stuff off your desk as quickly as possible. Yeah, it seems like that's um, more about politics and kind of personal oh, impressions and, 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 than and actually that's doing what, the work. That's what they learn. You know, right. that's that, and that's what they have to, I'm not, I'm not saying this is always the case, but you know, if you think about you're leaving somewhere, what are you going to teach somebody? You teach them how to do the stuff that keeps coming across your desk, your emails. The second way is those paperweight policy manuals that now have made their ways to websites so no one still can find any of the policies because they're, they're embedded in so many different places. But policy manuals have that information in it. And I think traditionally organizations have used – that translation from person to person, uh, just word of mouth, nothing visual, uh, and some policy narrative to communicate this is how we do things here. Sure. Uh, and I, I can't, uh, frankly, remember the last policy manual I actually uh, digested. <laughs> yeah, digest it. Uh, yeah, there's no di – if you digest it, you, you'll get some serious heartburn. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's there, there's so – and everybody knows this. I mean, it's yeah. it's something we have to do. It helps in the conversation, but then it's just the document that sits on the shelf. And likely and, is very rarely updated as the organizations change. Am I right? I mean, how often do you edit a, a policy manual? You know, that's another excellent point because – when you have a simple process map, and one of the premises that we use in the design of these is that a process, whether it is a, a high level, here is how we do procurement across the whole organization, uh, or how we pay a bill, a process map should fit on one page, eight and a half by 11. Now, that seems like, a, well, why are you making that constraint on there? But I can tell you what it does is a couple of things. It forces the design of these maps to make sure there is a sufficient amount of information, but not so much that people get lost. When you look at a lot of Visio documents, which are often used in the design of a new system, uh, there isn't much thought to, and again, they're for designers, they're not for end users. Uh, the idea behind these is these are to be leveraged as both 
helping a group trying to uh, deconstruct something, but ultimately they can be taken from their current format. Because if you saw, if you saw one, this is so interesting. We were doing an audio podcast about something visual, but if you looked at it, you'd say, "Oh, it's this actually seems doable and easy to work with," uh, and that is really what you want to do. You want to be able to take this iteration that you are designing and then you actually give it to users to use. The, the other piece I'll, I'll mention to you is that what's interesting about this is there really are two pieces to this. One is the work of designing a process map and the iterative nature of it because it is about getting the ideas out of people's heads so that you represent the, it, it, it's almost like creating a, uh, a novel and you do your first, or chapter, you do your first chapter and you read it again, you go, you know what? That didn't really communicate. So you do it again. And we've got some techniques we do this to do it in an efficient way. And ultimately, you end up with a product that you've gotten buy-in from the group that's doing it. And then that can be actually shared with the larger audience. Okay, so as we wrap up here, uh, help me understand what you, what, how you would recommend a, a team and an organization to get started with process maps. Can you can you break that down in a minute? Yeah, first thing I would do is identify people in your organization who have the ability to conceptually organize information, and you, there are people in your organization that do this, and see if you can position them to actually learn some of these skills. So for example, we're helping an institution right now, we're doing a training on this and teaching them over the course of a two day, first day we're gonna teach them about proxy mapping methodology and how we do it. And the second day is gonna be a workshop where they're actually gonna use their own data to create their own process maps. But I would say that rather than just hire consultants, and we have done this, uh, to come in, do it and then leave, you're gonna get greater leverage if you teach some internal people how to do this, and then you position them to help your other groups. Outstanding. Uh, the uh, I think this is a, this is a real enabling uh, tool, and it's it's what's so beautiful about it is that it's not it's a process that doesn't rely on any sort of silver bullet technology. It really is a much more organic kind of shoulder to the grindstone. Let's understand what's how the work is getting done and who's doing it, not some new system. That's exactly right. I love that you called it beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I honor you by saying your work is beautiful. I honor you Howard. with, the beautiful, you with statement. the beautiful statement. Thanks for your time today, Howard. This has been a great, uh, a great conversation. And uh, to everybody listening, thank you for downloading. Make sure to catch up with us. If you're just listening to this on the website, you can go to uh, iTunes and do a search for Navigating Change or Tidal Link, and you will find this podcast to which you can subscribe for free and listen to all the new episodes as they come out uh, on your mobile audio device. And uh, also make sure to follow us on uh, on Twitter at uh, uh, tybelink.com slash Howard Tybel. You can hear all of Howard's uh, uh, pithy remarks and connections to new blog posts and subscribe to our new newsletter, et cetera, et cetera, everything you need to know about Tidal Link. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next week on Navigating Change.